I'm here tonight with Ryan Fowler, Keisha Rahm, and Dane Whitman. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves in a second, uh, but everyone can give a wave right now. Uh, and I also uh, want to thank my mom, Judy Kanoy, who's volunteered her time to, inter to be an ASL interpreter for this event and our issue events recently, and Progressive Insider for producing this for us uh, and making sure that it's live for you all to see. Uh, we want to just let you know that next week's event on Tuesday is going to be about uh, bold climate action, and that's Tuesday the 28th at 7. And, um, and tonight we do have three candidates with us, myself. I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Keisha Rahm is running for Chittenden County Senate, and Dane Whitman is running for Bennington 2-1. I got it. Uh, and we have a donation link that we'll put up, and we would love it if you can, if you would donate to all of us. Uh, if one, your one donation will be split evenly between all of us. Uh, so please uh, feel free to do that. So we're here to you tonight to talk about the overdose crisis. Uh, and uh, many know my personal story, but we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I wanted to just give everybody a chance to briefly introduce themselves, what they do, what brought them to this work a really quick introduction and then we'll come back and do get more in depth so we will start with uh ryan fowler go ahead hi everyone uh thank you for tuning in at home um thank you brenda for hosting this my name is ryan fowler and i'm a person in recovery from a substance use disorder uh, Long and short of that is that I could both uh, used and sold drugs for about 10 years in New Hampshire. Um, I'm a person uh, in recovery from uh, some mental health disorders as well. And I've been in recovery for uh, five, going on five and a half years. And I'm now a certified recovery support worker working in uh, New Hampshire, um, doing some harm reduction work, uh, focusing on overdose prevention and harm reduction. Um, I'm able to use my lived experience to help other people and you know, try to move away from the war on drugs and towards a uh, public health response to address this public health crisis. Uh, we call this a uh, disease or a health condition, but we treat it like a crime. And so I'm really motivated by you know, people that I love, people that I serve, and people who are going through this. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna kick it over to Dane Whitman. Hi everybody, uh, thank you for joining tonight uh, to talk about this important issue. Thank you Ryan for uh, speaking and Brenda and Kesha and everybody who's joining as a panelist. Um, really glad that people are coming out to spend their time while there's a beautiful sunset going on to you know dedicate, dedicate this part of their work to this, um, it's incredibly important. Um, I am a candidate for the Vermont House of Representatives in uh, Bennington 2-1. And as far as a lot of these issues go, um, as far as the overdose crisis, I'm going to be frank where I'm coming at this from a place of personal experience and empathy towards it, more so than an expert in any way. I am here to learn from people and learn from people's experiences. Um, I really think that that is my job at the moment. So I look forward to sharing the little bit that I do know, um, but otherwise, thank you everybody for welcoming me tonight. Very generous. Thank you, Dane, and thank you, Ryan. Uh, and I also will welcome now Keisha to introduce herself. Thanks so much, Brenda. Good evening, everyone. And um, thanks for taking on this important topic. Um, I think it's really hard for us to take in the overwhelming nature of a lot of what's happening to us in this current pandemic and also think about all the crises we've, we're facing that are only being exacerbated um, so I want to thank you for drawing attention to this issue. Uh, I was a state legislator for eight years, four terms for Burlington. I'm running for Chittenden County State Senate and ha have made um, understanding opioid addiction and the opioid crisis a part of my personal and professional and political 
life. Uh, my sister struggled with addiction and was homeless for a long time in Los Angeles. Um, you know, it, it's run in our family and it has affected our, our lives. Um, and when I think about how we tie these crises together, um, I'm struck by some of the research I did in West Virginia, Kentucky, Portugal, uh, many places in the world. But in West Virginia, Dr. Gupta there, who's the chief medical officer, said something that stayed with me. He said, many of us in the medical field uh, really wanted to treat people's pain, but we ended up trying to treat their suffering. And if someone couldn't afford to get their teeth fixed or get a knee replaced, opioids were the solution that you know was affordable and available to them when they couldn't afford the thing that would really make their lives better. And I think we're only going to see more of that as this economic crisis hits. Um, and continues to sort of hit us in waves. So, you know, I'm just really struck by how related all of these crises are and how if we don't under uh, address the underlying issues, we're going to repeat the same mistakes. So I appreciate us having this conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Keisha. And uh, I want to just say that in a little while, we'll also get to um, some of what's happening in Vermont as, uh, as the crisis has hit and ways in which perhaps we have a little bit left behind or a lot of it left behind uh, the population of people in recovery and in active use uh, and uh, maybe creating a larger problem in some ways and in some ways um, there's been some other unexpected i think um, impact uh, that ryan might even talk about in his state uh, and uh, i want to just uh, start by saying if you are on if you could sign in uh we put the sign in in the link and that way we will send you the materials that we put up in the chat and in the um, facebook live link uh we'll also send them to you uh so that you can refer back to them if you'd like uh and we would love for everybody to sign in just so that we whether you're on the facebook live stream whether you're on progressive insider whether you're on um this here with us uh, we know that there's lots of you in lots of different places, and this will help us to make sure that we get you the information you need. Uh, before we get started uh, entirely, I'd like to just talk a little bit about our expectations as people ask questions. So um, we are coming at this, at a, as Dane put, from a place of empathy and compassion. Uh, and we are talking about the science of the disease and what we need to do in the human response. And so we ask you if you have questions, we understand that some of this might be new information or might be different than what you, than what you have um, learned throughout your life. And we ask you to ask your questions and respectfully and uh, not use degrading terminology uh, to talk about people who are in recovery or in active substance use disorder or opioid use disorder. We know that this issue is really complicated for a lot of people and we understand that and we wanna be able to answer your questions, but we won't tolerate um, any type of um, stigmatizing, uh, overt stigmatizing uh, towards people who are uh, who are struggling with this disease or in recovery, just as we would not for any racial justice or any uh, any other type of um, of bias. So we just want to make sure that you all are aware of that as we get started. Um, so we're gonna kick it off by. I, we're going to kick it off by talking about um, our stories a little bit. I am going to start uh, by uh, having Ryan tell a little more about his story, and then I'm going to let Dane go, and then I'll I'll take it from there. Okay. All right. Um, how long do you have me to go for on this one? Uh, just a, a brief version, but make but feel free to tell your story as much as you can. So two minutes, three minutes. Cool. Right on. Yeah, so uh, again, I'm Ryan, I'm a person in recovery. Uh, basically, my story is um, becoming more and more common. I you know, grew up in essentially a middle class home. I didn't really go without anything. You know, I never, you know, all my needs were met. Um, you know, there was some uh, alcoholism in my home and some mental health issues in my family but essentially I lived a pretty normal life but as I got older um, I know now that I developed <laughs> issues with anxiety and then depression as an adolescent um, and I didn't know how to deal with that I didn't have language for that um, I really just knew that drugs were bad and people who did drugs were losers 
And then I entered high school and all the cool kids were drinking and using cannabis. And I kind of was suicidal at that point. I didn't really know what that was about. And so drugs seemed like a really good idea at the time. And, um, you know, that really quickly in high school became opiates and that includes heroin. I experimented pretty much everything because I felt like the system had, had lied to me and largely it had, you know, I was kind of always a political nerd. So I understood the drug war. And so I, um, you know, graduated high school, uh, became an injection dr drug user and spent about 10 years of my life in uh, active addiction, using and selling drugs and uh, found recovery in 2014, found treatment, found um, alternative sentencing through a uh, diversion program. I'm miraculously not a felon today. Uh, today I'm gainfully employed, uh, using my experience to help others and um, you know really try to shed light on these issues of uh, structural violence and the kind of uh, uh, systemic issues and uh, discrimination that occurs against people who use drugs. Um, these are really complicated issues. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what happened, what it was like. And uh, now life is great. I, I love recovery. Uh, it looks a little different for me today. I don't go to meetings much anymore. I kind of have my own personal life. Um, you know, glad to share my experience and happy to answer any questions as this goes on. So thank you for listening. My turn. <laughs> thank you, Ryan, uh, for sharing your story. Um, I will. Um, so I was invited here to share my story and my experiences. And I'll admit that uh, you'll watch me kind of flinch here and there because the vulnerability of sharing uh, this part of my life is something that's still a little bit uh, new to me in, in a way. Um, but uh, in a lot of ways, I share similar things with Ryan uh, and uh, somewhat uh, had a lot of, I grew up in a family where a lot of our needs were met um, relatively middle class, uh, things like that. And, but also dealing with, uh, addiction. Um, and I want to be clear, uh, I did reach out to my brother to be sure that he's okay with me sharing him within this story and, and things like that. Uh, my, um, my entire family though, uh, has clearly been dealing with a legacy of trauma. Um, which sort of made its way uh, through. And I think uh, my brother, who's been in recovery for about three years now, has made it clear to me the link between um, substance use, trauma, uh, criminal justice, um, and on, on so many levels between trauma, violence, uh, and, and otherwise. So I think that for me, um, I had an interesting experience growing up in high school as well in a family that really did not provide me with a lot of guidance for myself either as far as uh, substance use was concerned. Uh, my brother is older than me, so I was able to sort of pick up on um, the challenges that he was having and I guess found a, a different way to um, adapt in, in a way that I could still uh, work with some of the same uh, issues, some of the same challenges, but still be able to, you know, get through school and f on for all intents and purposes, I guess, uh, look good on paper. Um, <laughs> so uh, went through that. Um, but while my brother was struggling, um, with his addiction at the same time, my grandfather was self-medicating with opioids um, and um, basically having those two events going on simultaneously as far as my brother starting with pharmaceuticals um, and my grandfather being prescribed pharmaceuticals at the same time and seeing the impacts that, that those were both having on their lives um, was something that affected me. So um, I grew up in Southern California, came over to uh, attend Bennington College and found that 
uh, for a very long portion of the time, uh, my brother was still living with my father um, and my extended family continually urged my father to put my brother out on the street um, to stop supporting him, um, basically saying that he belonged in jail. Um, my brother eventually did end up um, serving time in which I uh, visited him. And uh, as far as the conversations that we have now, um, he's been in and out of rehab five or six times. Uh, he's, this is kind of like the first long-term time that he's been in recovery. And um, uh, the, it's very interesting for us to have conversations uh, and about where, where I am now engaging with things on a political level. Um, so I think one thing that we did agree on was that <laughs> there's, there's a lot of room to continue uh, bringing stories into the conversation. So, so thank you everybody for your time. I wanna thank you both for your stories. Um, I think that I, uh, it is two years later and it's still very hard for me to tell mine. So I just want you to know that going in. Um, so uh, it was March 7th of 2018 when I had decided that I would run for governor. And on March, finally, I had been researching it for quite some time. And then March 8th of 2018, my nephew died of a heroin overdose. And he was the son of my brother who died just over 20 years ago, also while using heroin. Um, I had been a huge part of his upbringing, and um, I really didn't ever think that I would leave the house again. That's my personal experience of it uh, was that I really didn't think I didn't think I'd run. I did not think that I would leave. I, I mean, it was weeks before I could leave my house except uh, to go for a walk, um, and I uh, and I continue to cry every day. I have at least one part of every day when I cry, um, and and uh, that has not changed. <clears throat> My nephew struggled with opioid use disorder for seven years. Um, he uh, tried heroin, what he told me, and of course we can't know his full story. And I will say this, I asked him um, before he died if I could tell his story because he had been in recovery for a year, and I thought that on the campaign trail I would be telling his story of success. Um, and, uh, so I know that he does want his story told and, uh, so he had been in and out of uh, treatment with inadequate ac accessibility to buprenorphine, uh, with, uh, inadequate, definitely he has, he had bipolar disorder, inadequate accessibility to bipolar medication or psychiatrists in that, our state. We were regularly told that there was small or no waiting lists as we got towards the end of the time. Um, he was demonized. We had kept secret the way that my brother died because of the stigma attached to it. Uh, and we uh, did not want people to think negatively about my brother. We, he did not have opioid use disorder. He was uh, using it though to numb pain, um, what we suspect was bipolar, but had never been diagnosed. Um, and, uh, and trauma that he had experienced. Uh, Kaya told me that he, that's my nephew, he told me that he tried it for the first time um, because his, he wanted to know what his dad was doing when he died. Um, and that trauma of his dad dying, they were very close. He remembered him still. He was four and a half when he died. He remembered him still uh, uh, well in, all the way into adulthood. He remembered experiences that they had together and that he, it, and it was almost impossible for him to let that go. Um, and then with his bipolar, what he found was that it numbed pain that he was having. Uh, and the complication with bipolar is that, that when he felt up, he felt when he was manic, he felt um, good. So it was hard to stay on medication. It was hard to convince himself to stay on medication um, until he did find the right one, but then keeping himself prescribed was very difficult. Um, Multiple times he went into treatment like Maple Leaf here in Vermont. Uh, the last time that he went into Maple Leaf, uh, it was outpatient and, and Maple Leaf closed without warning to any of its patients and without, um, any, without 
giving them anywhere else to go. Um, Kaya had been doing really well at that point. He was in Burl He was staying in Burlington because it was closer and it, he was doing better there. Um, and he relapsed uh, or had a reoccurrence, which is another new language for relapse, um, almost immediately. Uh, and uh, and it was one of the and and then there was a time when he was in a recovery home, and he was removed from the recovery home for using buprenorphine, which he was just trying to stay alive. Um, and he was using it prescribed, but he was removed. Um, and that was one of the worst reoccurrences I had ever seen him have. Uh, and uh, the last time that he had a reoccurrence before his death, um, he, he and I had many text conversations uh, where I asked him to please just go to detox, just walk yourself to the retreat and go to detox here in Brattleboro. Um, and he did um, tell me that I said, he said, you don't know how excruciating it is. And I said, he, he said, I, I'm su I'd be suffering. And I said, you seem like you're suffering now. And he said, I am so much. You don't know so much. So I want to make clear when we talk about this, that people who are in active use do not want to be where they are. They do want, to, but this is a disease and that we need to treat it as such. Um, I am. I have a link that we'll put up to Kaya's story so you can hear the full breadth of his story. And I just wanna say that before he started using, we sent him to a treatment center that was recommended to us in Utah where he was abused and we did not know until he came back. Um, and a big part of his trauma came from that. And so I really want us to be really cautious to understand that we don't know people's stories. We don't know why, and we don't know how much suffering the family is already experiencing around them as they reflect upon their part when maybe we, there were times when we believed that we shouldn't help him at all. Um, and the, the, that we all, if there are those of you listening or watching who have that feeling right now, I have been there. I have been there where I thought buprenorphine was not the answer. I have been there where I thought, um, that we shouldn't be helping, uh, but it was really important for me to not only understand the humanity of the issue, but also the science. And when I began to understand the science and the humanity, and I understood that it was compassion and love that brought my nephew into recovery and shame, um, which I'll get to later uh, when we're talking about it, but shame and disdain that had him have his final relapse um, and die. And so I really want us to start to think about it a little bit differently. That's differently than I've ever told this story. Uh, so it's just what came out today. <laughs> so thank you all. Um, but I really do, um, and, and what it leaves is, our, is family members all across our state and country who, um, who also are suffering and um, who are continuing a cycle of trauma uh, that we then have to address and deal with. And in my own family, we saw that this disease can be intergenerational and, um, and, uh, and that you can lose multiple generations of people due to that loss. So um, my nephew and brother are buried next to each other. Um, by my, that was my nephew's wish. So, um, so that, but, but very painful for us. Uh, so I want to just um, go from there to just uh, a more uplifting story of the history of the drug war. Um, and uh, it's not at all uplifting, just spoiler alert. Um, and I'm just going to tell it to you a really brief history of the drug war um, as I told it in tweets in December. And we're also going to put the link to that those tweets up so that you can actually see if you don't understand. And then Ryan, we're gonna kick it over to Ryan and Ryan is going to uh, to uh, tell us a little bit of the history, more of a deeper history of how that where opioids comes into that picture. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> in the late 1800s, many drugs were prescribed to treat illness. Typical opiate, co opiates, cocaine, were, uh, users were upper middle class women. This was all legal. Um, then in 1875 and 1909, criminalization of opium came. Then cocaine, so I wanna just add in here real quick that this has never been a war on drugs. It has been a war on people who use drugs 
and it's only been used to um, stigmatize uh, people who are different in some way or another, um, depending on the time in our history. So uh, then cocaine, which had been typically associated with upper middle class white people, it began to be associated with black folks and um, the movement to make it illegal began then. Then there was prohibition because immigrants moved were moving in. Prohibition, of course, didn't work. We all know that. We've heard that. Uh, so I don't know why we think it will work with drugs. Um, and big business was threatened and so on. And the war was never on the drugs. Like I said, it was a war on people. So the modern day war on drugs began in 1971. So we have skipped a lot. Uh, but 1971. Um, and to meet its agenda on marginalized people. So mechanisms of oppression were created, the anti-war left and liberation fronts of people of color, LGBTQIA+, and others had possibilities of gaining power, and people were with power, white people, white men were scared, and, um, and that is where the war on drugs began, because they were afraid that people who had historically been marginalized may gain power. Um, uh, this quote uh, says everything, is what I always say, to the, about the war on drugs. Um, it's, I, I refer to it as gross when I'm talking about it, but it says everything um, the, about the racist origins. You want to know, I have to read it directly, you want to know what this is really about? Um, and by the way, this is John Ehrlichman. Uh, counsel and Assistant to President Nixon for Domestic Affairs and Watergate co-conspirator. Um, so you want to know what this is really about? The Nixon White House had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war, against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So that is um, a direct quote from him. Um, then the way of addressing the drug use uh, will always be racist, classist and anti-democratic. Uh, in the 80s and 90s was a huge <clears throat> catapult into hysteria about the war on drugs. Uh, and we know what happened during that time. We uh, had harsh sentences, incarceration for nonviolent drug law, zero tolerance policies and school policies, DARE, uh, drug education, federal ban on syringe exchanges, public hysteria and the harm of drugs, particularly crack, um, and lack of focus on treatment and evidence-based policies. Uh, the schedule, so this, thank you for all tolerating this little moment. Um, the schedule itself is a political apparatus, uh, this, the drug schedule, right? It's a political apparatus. Cannabis and heroin are in the same schedule. So if you can understand uh, where that would be wrong. Um, and then it's used to criminalize folks. The drug war to criminalize communities, civil, things like civil asset forfeiture, deep impact on marginalized communities, um, is it's not related to actual crime. Of course, civil asset forfeiture is not related to actual crime. It, it, so, and, and it deeply impacts marginalized communities. So I really want to say that again. Um, mass incarceration is uniquely violent in democratic society because in many states, you will lose the right to participate in democracy. So it is uniquely violent. It gives pe takes people away their vote and their voice. In our state, we're very lucky that that is not part of um, our war on drugs. We have removed that, and so people still continue to have their vote and voice. Um, the stigma shifts are deep and they're real. That's really important to understand. And uh, here's the chart of how, well, the leading cause of death for people under 55 <clears throat> Is what now? Now this is overdose. Of course, we're we're good. This has shifted a little in this crisis. So just to be clear, um, life expectancy has dropped now for three years in a row for um, millennial and Generation Z uh, generations. Um, people are more likely to die of overdose than have a car accident or gun violence. That's where it started to shift. That's where our change 
um, in the way that we're addressing it because it was now imp impacting, as we're seeing here, upper middle class, middle class white people. Um, so we had to shift the way that we started to look at it, though we have not gone far enough. Um, Trump's policies were harmful, not helpful. He often talks about it in a way that sounds like he's being helpful, but actually his policies are quite harmful because he continues to stigmatize the same groups. Um, and drug-induced homicide laws are a huge, huge issue. So I want to just make sure that we know that and address it later. Um, then there's also harm that I didn't even realize as I started to really dig deep into the history, um, that things like banning vapes. Um, that that is actually part of this same system, and we need to think about how we talk about uh, that because it doesn't actually change whether or not people use them. It changes how, what is in the vape that they get. Plus, it's not reality of the science um, in terms of what was causing the problem. Um, and then we just need to use data-driven facts. And I'm going to kick it right over to Ryan on that front. So that, can be able to, that was my really very line line by line item of the history of the war on drugs just to give you a brief uh overview and now here is ryan awesome thank you um so i'm gonna try to keep this brief but i guess to talk about opioids you really need to kind of understand what they are it's really any compound that enters the human body and touches on the opioid receptors in the body and creates a response so even people who have never used opioids have these uh, circuits in their brain for opioids, and that's because the body produces its own opioids, its own pain relief. Uh, the term endorphin is actually short for endogenous morphine because we knew about morphine before uh, endorphins. And so the opioid center of the brain um, is really responsible for uh, pain regulation, that's emotional pain uh, and physical pain, and it's also largely responsible for uh, interconnectivity of human beings, so uh, engaging with people. And so for about 5,000 years, people have used exogenous opioids, uh, opiates, from the opium poppy. Uh, the first recorded human history of opioid use was um, opium in um, southern Iraq, uh, previously uh, Mesopotamia, and it was a religious ceremony that celebrated the role of pain in human life. And from there you see medical use throughout ancient Egypt. Uh, for the large majority of human history, opioids were celebrated. Uh, they were innovations in medicine, they made life more enjoyable, they were used as a treatment for uh, as a cough suppressant, um, largely uh, people did die, of course, people did become a a addicted, but it really um, wasn't all that bad compared to what we see today, uh, largely, uh, as Brenda had talked about, um, upper middle class people use heroin uh, mail order through Sears catalog, um, basically you had a market for opioids and cocaine that was regulated. Um, doctors, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, and what happened when they initiated prohibition was that you took this market from doctors and farmers growing poppies, where largely um, opiate use was poppy tea or opium, and that can be domestic, that can grow, be grown in, in someone's yard, um, to organize crime. And so the products become more uh, refined. And so going from coca leaf and coca tea to cocaine, from cannabis to hashish, from opium to heroin, uh, from heroin to fentanyl, from fentanyl to car fentanyl. And what we've seen through um, 105 years of you know established prohibition throughout the nation is that it doesn't work. It doesn't work for alcohol and it doesn't work for opioids. Um, all that we've seen in the history of um, prohibition is um, you know, structural violence against marginalized people. Um, I used to kind of wave the banner that it's a failed war on drugs. It's largely successful. Um, the first prohibition that occurred in the United States was in uh, San Francisco in the late 1800s to directly target Chinese immigrants building the, the railroad. And that was the time when you could be uh, overt about your racism. And really from there, as Brenda talked about, they used specific substances to target people. And that was really elevated with Nixon's war on drugs. And then um, Ronald and Nancy Reagan doubled down even more. And we've really just had a series of um, 
a criminal response to a public health crisis. Um, and um, it's really just made the drug supply more dangerous. Um, it's gotten way out of control. And if you really, if you wanted to create a system that fostered addiction or fostered an overdose crisis, you would construct the war on drugs, a system of criminalizing and punishing people with a substance use disorder. And that disorder is largely characterized by feelings of isolation and feelings of disconnect from people. And so we put them in literal cages and separate them from those around them. Um, it was a big role in a uh, movement to really um, kind of separate men from their families, uh, specifically uh, black men in um, urban areas, uh, looking at the history of um, you know, what was going on with Iran-Contra when Reagan was president and Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas. And, you know, everyone at that time knew that the United States government was complicit in bringing cocaine into the United States from Nicaragua to be brought to uh, California to be processed into cocaine. Um, and uh, Freeway Rick Ross did 20 years in federal prison and he wrote a book and he's been out saying, I knew I was selling cocaine for the government and he was making a million dollars a day. You know, this has really always been about violence towards specific people. You know, um, you know look at heroin in, in Vietnam in the 60s. This isn't the first opiate crisis and you really just have this system that has to come to an end you know how many people can can die from this kind of systemic genocide of a certain population you know i survived i got lucky i'm a you know middle class white kid from new hampshire with a with a great family and a support system i got lucky and i aged out but you know any human behavior serves a purpose you know whether that's you know pain relief emotional relief uh, what have you, uh, we need to look at what's right with the human behavior and figure out how to replace that for individuals. You know, people know that they're going to face discrimination and criminalization and on and on and on, and yet they still use. So, you know, we really need to look at, you know, what's going on with the individual and the world around them and bring them supports. Um, you know, it's really important to be offering medication assisted recovery for these um, opioid issues, um, and that gives people a pathway towards, towards recovery. And But here we are today, a system that criminalizes people for a uh, mental health condition. So hopefully with this COVID crisis setting a, a new precedent for uh, drug policy and public health response, we can set a precedent to establish science-based policy to address this human behavior that, you know, probably isn't going to go away. Uh, so uh, I want to just uh, say that when I think about um, all of the, um, I think about my nephew too had a lot of support around him and still didn't survive and, uh, and that all of us were able uh, to do a lot to help him to be with him to be with him when he was in hospitals to uh, to get him to treatment we, we really did we a big family. Um, so I often think about people who have no one because um, because even with all that, uh, he didn't make it. And so um, I wanted to actually uh, send it to Keisha now because uh, she's gonna talk a little bit about what, what is happening internationally. I was gonna tell you about what's happening in Vermont first, but I actually think the setup that we've just had um, would be great to hear about uh, how it's being handled differently internationally. And then we'll, we'll get into a deeper discussion about that and how it relates to what's happening in Vermont right now uh, and across the country. Uh, so thanks so much to uh, Ryan for jumping in there and giving us a little deeper dive on opiates uh, and, um, and how we got here. Thanks, Brenda. And thank you all for sharing your personal stories. I think one of the most important things um, that I've learned is that that empathy gap makes a huge difference in how we respond to people. And the more we can share stories, uh, the more we can close that gap. Um, and at the same time, it is a huge challenge that America is still on the forefront of addressing that in diverse societies, that empathy gap remains very hard to close and it's very easy for us to other people. Um, the other thing that I took from all your stories is, and Brenda, what you just said is how much relationships matter um, and 
one thing I was struck and, and relating that to another thing you emphasized, which was how important data is. Um, in West Virginia, in looking at the last 800 or so opioid deaths when the chief medical officer got there, um, it was the there was very common trends that people were aware of things like a majority of the folks were um, middle aged white men who were in the coal mining industry um, and may have had a disability or an injury. Um, but the other thing that was really startling for lawmakers there to learn is that about three quarters of the people who had died uh, had sought treatment in the last week before they were alive. So, you know, something didn't work out. Uh, they were turned away. They didn't get what they needed. They still felt empty inside. Um, but a lot of people, it's human nature still to reach out and seek help. And that's true, uh, you know, for those we've lost. Um, so a lot of the positive stories that come out of places that are really decimated, like West Virginia, or places that have really almost um, brought their overdose deaths to zero, like Portugal, is that they're pretty pretty homogenous. And so, um, you know, they've dealt with these crises, but they are acutely aware um, that, especially in a place like Portugal, the people who were facing addiction and were in kind of drug dens and things were very visible to the to the community in the 80s and 90s that things were on a, a downward spiral. Um, those included the uh, kids of lawmakers and, you know, members of, of parliament in Portugal. They were people who were very high up in the system and had connections. And so um, people in Portugal are, are very clear to say when we decriminalized every drug, um, we did so knowing that you know, leaders were seeing their own kids face drug addiction, and that was a very, very closed empathy gap. Um, some of the really bright spots in both um, places like Portugal and West Virginia, um, in Portugal, there in the bigger cities, there is mobile treatment. Um, so you can get your medication assisted treatment in, in locations that um, the truck kind of moves around Lisbon, for example. And if it's one of the greatest innovations I've seen um, for people to be able to go on their way to work to the side of the road, get what they need. Um, you would have people coming out of, you know, un under the, the highway underpass to get their treatment while doctors and chefs and, you know, professors stopped and got their treatment and then went on to work. So it was a great equalizer, in fact, in that society. Um, whereas we might spend, you know, nine out of every ten dollars on enforcement here, they spend nine out of every ten dollars there on treatment. Um, you almost never interact with a police officer if you have a substance abuse disorder. Um, you're almost entirely interacting with social workers and nurses and medical professionals about your treatment plan. Um, and, you know, I think finally, um, when I, I, I put some links, I think that Jacob will will put up soon, but. Um, when you think about a really desperate situation, like in West Virginia, where they have the highest overdose death rate in the country, a lot of despair, both economic, health-wise, et cetera, um, there's some really bright spots in the court system where you, again, it's about celebrating people's stories and building relationships for people that don't have them. Um, all the social workers, the judges, the, the uh, folks in the courtroom, would both you know defenders and prosecutors would meet beforehand and talk about every case in drug court and say things like you know that person might be a little late for their uh, drug tests because they walk from three hours away you know up the side of a mountain to get to drug treatment they don't have a car their so-and-so's mom moved back in and that's really bad for their recovery so-and-so got a job at subway and then the, every time when people you know when, when the folks show up for court they, everyone's heard their whole story before they even get there every time. Um, they, they, they celebrate, they get to pick presents and prizes for doing well and showing up. It's like, reminds me of the best parts of school and what motivates us as humans. And, um, you know, people cheer victories for other people. They've created community in court. Um, so, you know, these were things that I, I found particularly uplifting um, in my travels as we think about you know what makes a difference there are two things that i think are important especially on a day like 420 just to mention um that are hard for people to hear people in our harm reduction movement here in the united states number one um 
Portugal decriminalized everything. They have not legalized anything. They have not legalized marijuana because they are of the belief that if you're treating addiction like an illness, you wouldn't commercialize these products. So we really have to think very long and hard about the differences in our system. And in fact, Portugal is looking at what the U.S. does with the potential legalization of marijuana to decide how they would move, but they're not moving quickly on legalization. Decriminalization has been their policy. Two, several years ago when I went to Portugal, they were building their first uh, their first safe consumption facilities. That was not a big part of their reduction in overdose deaths. They had seen those um, implemented first in places like Spain and Sweden. And if you ask most people in Europe who are in the harm reduction movement, they will say they're such a critical piece of harm reduction, but it's usually to get those last cases where people really truly can't you know, live without drugs and, and need a safe place to do them regularly in as part of their recovery process or as part of their everyday life. Um, but that, you know, I was, I got there looking for the, the um, you know, safe injection facilities and, and sort of couldn't understand like where they were. And they were building them for the first time to say, we need to get to that last 5% that we, we haven't reached. Um, and I just say that because they, everyone recognizes how important they are in other harm reduction movements in other countries. But our political fight to make that the first thing we do may miss an entire paradigm shift that we need to make in our society to be ready to support people and support them through going to a safe injection facility, getting what they need. Um, I, I want to see that as part of our solution, but we should also acknowledge that it was huge paradigm shifts in other countries that reduced overdose, overdose deaths, not just um, Safe injection facility. Uh, so that's a really good place to pick up what's happening here in Vermont. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, you bring up a good point. I mean, I think that there's a, there is a paradigm shift that is needed and that, that, that each piece is only part of the puzzle. And one of the frustrations I've had as a family member and as an advocate and as a candidate, actually, on this issue, uh, is that uh, we're talking about, um, we often point to our successes and say things like, in Vermont, we're reaching three in 10 people. And um, we've been reaching three in 10 people for many years now. And uh, so my uh, frequent response is, well, what are we doing about the other seven? Because we aren't really, re that's not three in 10, 30%. I always say uh, most middle schoolers know that's a failing grade. So uh, so it's really important for us to understand that, that no one solution is the same solution for everybody. Um, and that recovery is what the person in recovery says it is for them. And that's a big recovery shift that's happening um, in the recovery movement. It's no longer 12 step programs. Um, it is no longer complete abstinence for everyone. It is no, some people do need and want abstinence. Some people do need and want a 12 step program. Um, some people will uh, stop using heroin, but will still drink alcohol. Um, and if that's their recovery, that's their recovery. And so we do have to respect that. And it's, um, and I am finding that it is very difficult to uh, communicate that. that we across the state of Vermont and probably and across the country because we have been told this one thing for a very long time now that's really based um, on the platform of the war on drugs. And so uh, it, the, the first thing that we have to do is understand that there has to be the paradigm shift and we, that there has to be a shift to um, seeing it as a medical issue, a mental health issue, um, a trauma, as often the base or mental health issues, um, understanding where dual diagnosis support plays a role um, and a need, uh, and uh, and really eliminating the language that it's a choice and that people can just choose not to do it. Um, because there's a lot of things that are a choice. People who have high blood pressure, it's a choice to continue to eat steak and not exercise. People who have diabetes, it's a choice to continue to eat, to eat sugar. Um, there's a lot of choices that people make, but we still treat them when um, when they need help, and we still understand that the disease still needs treatment. And so I do want to just put that base up front. Uh, so 
in my campaign for governor, uh, I released a four part plan to heal the opioid epidemic, which we'll put up to it's I, now it says in progress because we're in the middle of making some shifts to it based on what has changed in the last couple of years. Um, and that puts harm reduction first, treatment and recovery on demand, including medically assisted treatment on demand, dual diagnosis support and criminal justice reform. Uh, briefly, what I did not talk about is the last time I saw my nephew, I spent the day in court with him, with him being shamed, uh, even though he had had a full year in recovery. Uh, and he was the healthiest I had ever seen him when I saw him, saw him in the morning. Um, he had been in treatment in Minnesota and had a full-time job in Minnesota and was planning to return there. Um, and uh, throughout the day, I watched him go into what, a shame spiral, which was part of his mental illness. Um, due to his trauma because the the treatment that he got at in this facility when he was a teenager before he was using uh, used shame um, methods of shame um, as punishment and as behavioral modification um, and so he went into a shame spiral uh, and I just hoped he would get back to Minnesota where his support system was um, even though he was from Vermont we wanted him home um, before he had a reoccurrence. I have a feeling we don't know and we'll never know that he had the reoccurrence while he was still home. Um, and that went from there for the two weeks. Um, but he was only home for one day. It does not take a long time to for you, your stigma to um, be uh, shifted uh, onto the person who's in recovery or who is in active use. Uh, so I ask us to implore us to try a different method. Uh, so this, the plan that I came up with is based on, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but it is based on uh, the science of the disease. And of course, my own experience as well as um, it's, it's shifted over the last few years as I've talked to police chiefs, uh, state's attorneys, people in recovery, family members all across the country, um, people in active use. Uh, because they, I, I want to make that clear. I, I keep saying that because it, people in active use are part of the conversation that we need to be having. Uh, so they need to also be at the table, letting us know what they need right now. Um, and you know, these things only shift if we're not just talking to doctors and um, and police chiefs and state's attorneys and uh, you know people in our health department. They only shift if we're talking to family members and people in recovery and people in active use, that they have to be part of the conversation. I'm very sorry, my son just came down with something on. Uh, and so uh, homeschooling in COVID, yay. So uh, I really want to just um, get implore us to start to look at this as the harm reduction model first, that that paradigm shift first. Um, it is essential for harm reduction that we have, uh, that we understand that we have to meet, I don't like the words meet people where they are, that, that we have to um, accept people where they are, and we have to, because um, they, they're going to be on whatever um, trajectory that they are on um, in terms of uh, entering recovery. And I also want to add that even if all we do is um, create short-term recovery or uh, or just um, make the time that people are here with us a more less painful in whatever way we can. Uh, that is time on in their lives that we have still, just as we would with a cancer patient, that is time in their lives that we have made them more comfortable um, and that we have, uh, that we have um, offered them love and compassion. And when they leave us, that we are able to just know that we, that whatever we did, we always showed love. And I wanna make sure that that's really important to all of us. But we also have to make some law change. And what I believe we really need is a, uh, a comprehensive overdose crisis plan. We're doing everything in very small piecemeal. We're reacting to stigma that's there saying, well, it's gonna take a while to change um, what police chiefs think about this. It's gonna take a while to change. That's great, but in the meantime, um, those of you that have seen the legislature, I should have kept, uh, kept a picture. Um, if you look at the House, um, the seats in the House, including the Senate seats, um, which nobody has for a while, but if you look at the House, including the Senate seats um, in Vermont, that is the number of people 
Um, that is, there's not enough seats in that building, in that room, for the number of people that will die during a biennium, during the two years um, between when people are elected. And if you look at the Senate seats, um, that is a, roughly the number of people in Vermont that will die during a legislative session. So while we're looking at a different paradigm right now when, we, when we're talking about um, deaths because of COVID, um, we uh, experience in Vermont the level of death we're experiencing right now, we experience with opioids uh, quite regularly. And we aren't taking the same urgent public health measures that we need to, that we are currently taking with COVID. And so I would, uh, we, when we're looking at things like um, there was just a bill that passed, and we were going to put up an article about it, uh, about the, uh, it didn't pass, but it only passed out of human services in the House. It took two years to get it through because of some of these stigma-based, uh, uh, people were really resistant to it uh, and fighting it. Uh, and uh, however, it passed unanimously, that means progressive, Democrat, and Republican, out of House Human Services. And if it is taken up on the House floor, I'm uh, I'm confident it will pass because of because it was unanimous. But it was to decriminalize buprenorphine, um, and what it does is it makes it so that um, so that people can carry about a two week supply. So those people that can't necessarily. Um, get a prescription, they don't have the transportation, they can't get to the hub every day, um, they aren't ready for whatever reason, shame, stigma, they don't want people to know that they have opioid use disorder, whatever is going on, they don't have health insurance, because that is a real barrier, um, that, that when they buy it, they can choose buprenorphine, the life-saving medication, over heroin that's almost definitely laced with fentanyl. Um, and <laughs> Uh, right now, sometimes the argument against it has been things like, um, well, within 72 hours, we can get people anywhere in the state, which isn't true, by the way, but within 72 hours, we can get people the, the um, buprenorphine that they need, uh, the medication that they need. And the truth is that not if they don't have transportation, not if they have to take care of their kids, not if they do not have health insurance. And furthermore, in those 72 hours, someone may have used heroin up to 17 times or more um, and risked their life that 17 times or more while they were waiting to get on that medication. Hi, so it is not an accurate, um, it is not an accurate representation. So those are the kind of things that Keisha was just talking about, that when we're really, when we're thinking about it, we have to think about this in a completely different way, which is what is going to not only help people survive, help them survive better, even if they don't survive, but the time they are here, and also what is going to ensure um, that, that we're also de uh, reducing the crime and the other collateral damage that, that is part of this disease. So um, that goes along with it. And so um, it really is, whether we know it or not, is impacting every single one of us across the state and across the country in whatever way it is. So even when I often say to people, even when you don't, even if you don't agree with me and uh, you think that my nephew was a loser who deserved to die, which is what people are saying when they say that to me, um, even if you don't agree with me, that's okay, I can accept that you don't agree with me, but I bet you also would like this to stop. I bet you would like to feel like people aren't gonna break into your house or your car, and that means that we have to use best practices to for this disease. Mm -hmm. So I still ask people to come with me on that. I think Keisha wants to say something about yeah. that. Yeah, Brenda, I mean, I really appreciate everything you're saying, and I had a story that really underscored that. Someone asked a question about how could we do what Portugal does here in the US? And I just recall a story with the mobile treatment facility where I went to a few of their stops. And um, one gentleman was talking to me who it was is Portuguese American. And he had you know, moved at a young age from Portugal to the US, had gotten in a lot of trouble with drugs and the law and um, essentially was deported, um, you know, even though he had some level of um, citizenship in the U.S. to Portugal. Um, he, you know, the second I walked up to the treatment site, he said, oh, this, this place is such a failure. 
because I use this medication as a treatment every day, and I still do heroin. I just use this to, you know, keep from getting dope sick, and so it's not really working. And, you know, the people are very happy to have him talk to me, and at the same time, you know, they're just, they're, they're saying, well, you know, tell her a little bit more about your life and how long you've been coming. So two years before, he had been living, you know, under the freeway, no shower in years, covered in bugs that were actively living on his body, um, had not talked to his family in years, no thought of anything but that day and how to get his fix. And, you know, in the two years that he'd been going to the van, he, he had a job, he, had, uh, he was all cleaned up, he had a place to live, and he was talking to his family and his kids, who he had been estranged from. Um, but in his sort of Portuguese American mindset, he couldn't see that as success. I still am addicted. I still take drugs. So I'm a failure. This whole thing is a failure. Um, and it was just the most stark sort of sense of like, if we, if we can't get out of this mindset that, you know, living with addiction doesn't mean you failed. It means you are, you know, doing the best you can with a disease you have to live, um, just like anyone else with a chronic illness works their hardest to live and to be there for other people and to have, you know, whatever sense of a normal life they can. Um, that is, that is still success. That's very much success. And it was just, um, almost comical the way if people come up, he says, this program doesn't work. Um, and he's one of the biggest success stories of it. That's a great story. And that's really what I think is important and, and what is, it's where the, sh the mentality has to shift among people in recovery and people not in recovery. Because like I said, we've all been taught something very specific about, uh, about this, which is that drugs are bad, people who do drugs are bad, um, it's a choice. Uh, yes, we have compassion, but you have to have accountability. And, uh, and I have a huge problem with the word accountability, which you may learn throughout this discussion, uh, because I don't think, um, I, where is the accountability for the, our state, our governments in our state and across the country? That's where I want to, like, we also need accountability. And, uh, and so we're often asking people to do, be successful the way that we think it's successful. And with not enough tools so we haven't offered them the tools and in that front um in vermont we have these hub this hub and spoke program uh that has been uh touted across the country but in reality um it doesn't work for everyone we're reaching three and ten people uh and the hub is somewhere it, until you're deemed responsible enough which in and of itself is a shame trigger for some people um, until you're deemed responsible enough, you have to go to that hub every single day for most people. And that means for some people, like in Northern Vermont, the Northeast Kingdom, they're traveling an hour and a half to get to the nearest hub in the, and an hour and a half back every single day. So you can imagine if they have kids, they have three hours of commuting and they have to get their kids to school and supposedly they're supposed to work. And I mean, we wouldn't expect that of a person who doesn't have um, as a limitations in whatever way that these people have limit, that these folks have limitations and it's it is an unreasonable expectation of uh of people in recovery or in active use uh and uh and there is and it's based on a flawed science so there is no evidence after some really great research at johns hopkins university i actually put um gave Jacob testimony that I did on H783, which I'll talk about later, but in there is some research on buprenorphine. So maybe we'll put it up now as well. Um, so the, some really great research at um, Johns Hopkins University that uh, basically said that the drug, I talk about buprenorphine a lot, but the drugs that are, that are helping with recovery don't, um, don't know if you're going to therapy or going to the hub. They still work anyways. And even if you are, you use them part of the time and you don't use them all of the time, um, then, uh, and you sometimes still use heroin, there's still a piece of that that is successful as Keisha was saying. And so um, right now we have to get over this hump that we're on where we're like, we're successful because we have, because that is preventing us from figuring out what would meet what would success look like 
for the other seven in 10 people that we aren't reaching right now? And what would it look like if our deaths went down? Because in Burlington, after they, when they have a pretty strong, um, you have pretty strong uh, harm reduction measures, um, of course more can be done, and pretty strong um, uh, decriminalization of buprenorphine, that, that the state's attorney and police chief there did that on their own, um, the deaths went down that year 50%. I actually don't know the numbers for 2019. I think they've been um, somewhat paused because of this crisis. So, uh, so we have. I've asked for them, and I, I think we hopefully we'll get them soon. Um, but uh, in that same year, 2018, when their death, when the deaths went down 50 percent, the deaths in my county, Windham County, went up 60 percent. We were the worst in the. And we, meanwhile, like we have all these supports here. No, we're doing good. No, we're not. So our deaths went up 60 percent, and we're not doing well in Bennington County, where whereas Dick. Uh, Senator Sears often says there's a broken spoke. And uh, he says, I think there's a broken spoke in Bennington. <laughs> and we're not doing well in Rutland County. In Bennington, I believe it went up 50%. In Rutland, it went up, I think, 35%. Nearly everywhere else in the state, our deaths went up. And the only reason our deaths stayed even in 2018 was because of Burlington's deaths going down 50%. Otherwise, they would have gone up. And Burlington's success was because of harm reduction. So really understanding, and when that happened, Burlington's officials didn't come out and say, we are successful, we've done it, we have, look at us, we don't have to do anything else. They came out and said, and I remember watching the press conference and wishing we all would do this more. They came out and said, this is good news. We have to see the trend for a couple of years to know. and." Um, and we haven't done enough until there are no deaths. And so that, and that is, needs to become our mindset um, because then I believe that's when we've come to a place where we're, um, where we're actually making change. So I've talked a lot, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Dane has something to say. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just saw a chat uh, question pop up that said, well, you talk about how social equality and justice reform tie directly into your goals as action measures. Um, I wanted to start uh, hearing everybody's different stories, and especially Kesha's one about the man in Portugal who felt that there was still a degree of uh, failure, even though there was so much progress in there, and thinking a lot about how all of the different things that we internalize within our culture and then sort of uh, project that onto other people. And something that I've reflected on with my brother is that I'm lucky. I think that's really what it comes down to as far as his path and my path. There's something different with either my brain chemistry or the people that were in the same grade as me. But when I think about the amount of work that he has done to get where he where he is now i i really reflect and think like you are better than me <laughs> you know it's like you have done so much more than i have uh so i think that's something to keep in mind um yeah as we as we approach this with empathy to, to get into the policy question um i happy to hear about the unanimous vote for the decriminalization at least leaving the the committee for Uber and i look forward to seeing how that uh progresses again a lot of my uh background has actually come from speaking to the director of uh project blueprint in bennington uh so it'll be good to kind of uh check my notes uh between these two places and keep those things in mind um but as a little bit of context, uh, Bennington County, where I'm running, has uh, the second highest uh, fatality rate from uh, overdose in the county, in the state of Vermont, and the lowest rate in the state of Vermont for follow-up with treatment. We do not have a hub, um, and so that is a question. Um, the director of Blueprint was investigating their work work was happening uh, towards 
doing it. And so it will be an interesting conversation um, on many fronts. And uh, again, not claiming that I have the right answer at this moment, but look forward to hearing from a lot of different people. Um, I would say that what I am interested in, I know I've s spoken to uh, Brenda before, I, I'm the kind of person that reads the report from the Department of Human Services. And I, I see what, okay, what are the statistics listed in this in this report? And of course, there's different uh, ways to look at uh, how that data maybe is presented in, in different ways. But anyway, one of the things that I did find from the Hub and Spoke model is that from their findings that there was improvement for participants, right, across the board. You saw uh, less um, injections, you saw better situations at home, you saw less emergency room visits, you saw improvements take place. But it was actually interesting, the only place where improvements weren't seen was in a vocational. Um, there is very little difference as far as that. And so that's something that's been interesting for me as stop. far as filling that gap um, as, as something there. So that's something that I'm interested in. Another couple policies that I'm working with right now is early childhood development, making sure that there are support systems in place um, from kind of cradle to a career or whatever that may be. Um, and then looking at increased reimbursement for mental health professionals, because I think it comes down to uh, workforce and available resources. So really seeing how we can deal with the increasing shortage of mental health professionals in our county. That's kind of where I am. I'm actually really interested to hear if any of you have uh, responses to some of the things that I said. Um, so as Dane and I have talked about, and I want to hear from Ryan a little about what the work he does, because I do think that plays in the harm reduction, but as Dane and I have talked about, um, I have a lack of trust for the Department of Health as it stands right now, um, because I have been in the room and being been told that something is happening in Vermont, that my family will stand up or other families all around me will stand up and say, that wasn't our experience. And it, it like falls on deaf ears. We nobody if nobody actually takes in that what they're saying is happening is not happening somewhere. And so um, that is a lack of transparency. I don't believe they don't know that that's not happening. I think there's a lack of transparency and that could have to do with the administration that we have right now um, because there is a lack of transparency overall. Um, but transparency is essential to, to, to uh, the public understanding and changing th their view of this um, illness, but they are still using language like accountability and uh, and abstinence and things that um, that are not that that we're growing away from. And um, it, like for example, the buprenorphine Mary issue, Francis. Um, the, the infamously um, no. the uh, the why well, I'm spacing his name, but our um, our health commissioner, Secretary of Health, said. Right. Say thank you, <laughs> Secretary Levine. Said uh, he said uh, the he said that that a policy of decriminalizing buprenorphine would be good anywhere in the country except Vermont, which was, in my opinion, like a really great example of Vermont exceptionalism. There is no that doesn't make any sense. If it would be good anywhere in the country, it will be good in Vermont because we have not reached everyone. And so um so Did I interrupt for one second. Did you spell the name of that medicine please? Yes, it's B U P R E N O R P H I N E. A tough one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so thanks. We were just answering a question from our interpreter. So I so I think that we really do want to talk a little bit about um about uh where why it's so important to hear not just from the Department of Human Services and not just from the Department of Health but also, and not just from police chiefs who, who, by the way, that's who they're working with a lot is police chiefs and state's attorneys, not people um, on the ground, 
but why it's so important to hear from people like Ryan and Vanessa, who was going to be on today, and uh, people whose family members and people who have done the research and other states and other countries, um, because we can get really lost in our own. I mean, the desire to pat ourselves on the back, I get it, because it's hard, hard work. Uh, and I come from a world where I don't pat my, anyone will tell you that I don't pat myself on the back unless I actually um, feel like I have accomplished my goal. I probably could pat myself on the back a little lot more often than I do, but I really find it to be important to do that. So when I have a success, I like jump out of my chair, uh, but, but I certainly um, feel like I'm not right till I'm right. And so I, I don't know if Keisha wanted to say something, I also wanted to kick it over to Ryan. Um, yeah, and I totally want to hear from, from Ryan as well. I just want to, I think it's such an important question of equity. Um, and we can't in Vermont just claim that we're the whitest state and sort of move on. And as Brendan and I have talked about a lot, um, we are highly disproportionate in the number of people of color that end up um, in the criminal justice system and in prison uh, for crimes that others do not end up in prison for. Um, I did want to, you know, I love the piece about early childhood education because I think this starts so incredibly young and um, I have introduced legislation that I feel is related um, that would stop using, um, it would end the use of suspension and expulsion for behavioral um, changes from young people. Um, I, I just feel like there are so many, there are so many systems that start to isolate people at a very young age and, you know, criminalize them um, and tell them they're going to be something and then it comes true. And that's why I also included a link to um, the kind of family treatment model for the court system, because we also in Vermont have a very high rate of family disruptions and taking children away from people who have addiction. And they're starting to realize in other states and hopefully you know, even here that you're really taking away someone's main reason to get clean and to live um, by taking away access to their children. Obviously their children's safety is paramount, um, but we have to really look at why we have so much family disruption and how we're creating a situation where someone feels like they have something to live for and to work toward. Um, and, you know, I mean, Brenda and I have also agreed on, and I've been able to work in the legislature on a number of initiatives uh, to understand criminal justice disparities in the state. Um, anytime you isolate someone and send them to prison, especially out of state where they're further away from their families, uh, you create a situation where they have less to strive for. Um, all Anyone will tell you in this harm reduction movement that relationship is the best medicine. Having the people you love uh, around you, having them as your goal, your reward is incredibly important. And that's less likely for uh, for people of color and um, the other people who are, you know, criminalized at a young age in the schools are people with disabilities. So low income people with disabilities, communities of color face greater isolation and much less empathy in the system. Yeah, so I, I'm going to keep it over, Ryan. I want to just say that um, I think that I had to talk deeply about the criminal justice reform piece of um, of my plan, but I really do encourage you to look at it because uh, that's a huge, it's a huge piece to me that we are in the top five, I believe, for racial disparities in our prison system in Vermont. Uh, and uh, it, uh, definitely on the forefront of my mind right now because COVID-19, I do feel like people in corrections are in a petri dish um, and we haven't done enough to protect them. And meanwhile, we have, we're in the top five for racial disparities. So therefore we're contributing um, to uh, how this is impacting people of color across the country, uh, which has a lot to do with their systemic issues. But it's the same with opioids too. I mean, we have, uh, the whiter you are, the easier it is to uh, end up not in prison for this illness. And um, so it does matter, and, and, and the wealthier you are. So if you don't have money for a, a, a lawyer, then you are gonna have a much harder time if you have a big family who's gonna sit behind you and show their support in their suit. Um, you know, there, there's going to be a big difference in the way that you're treated. And so I do think that um, if we don't center these solutions around equity, and if we don't make decisions uh, about equity, um, then uh, we have a serious problem. I'm going to kick it over to Ryan. And what I want to just say is uh, Keisha and I together worked on a uh, petition 
uh, about the prisons around COVID-19 and we're just gonna put it up and that is has some legislators have joined us and some candidates as well. Um, so please do uh, take it and sign it. Um, obviously, especially if you're from Vermont, but please sign it no matter what and help share it and get it, get it out there. Uh, here you go, there you go, Ryan. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this has been super enjoyable. I have so much to say to so many people, but um, I guess just given the time constraints, I will kind of go back to the general question of um, equity and justice uh, in terms of a drug policy that seems to make sense. Um, so really when we talk about a drug problem a uh, drug crisis, uh, we're really talking about problems of prohibition. Uh, really all that prohibition does is aggravate these problems. Um, and really it, it creates a system that pro, uh, proliferates drug use because um, if you're using drugs and you need to maintain a habit, there's only a finite number of things you can do to maintain that habit. Uh, and largely that involves selling drugs to other people. Um, and the reason that this impacts communities that are impoverished so much is because sometimes that is the um, economic means that makes the most sense at, at the time. And so if you're living in a rural area in Vermont or New Hampshire, and the you know number and the, the best legal opportunity for you to make money in your community pays you $12 an hour for 32 hours a week. Um, the other thing that, um, you could do is sell drugs and make hundreds of thousands of dollars in a short period of time. Uh, this is an economy that's always existed and will always exist. There's no recorded human history without drug use. And uh, what I like to highlight about Portugal in 2001 when they decided to decriminalize all drugs is that they had a form of uh, universal basic income. Uh, so people's needs were met, uh, they were housed, and with the decriminalization came uh, an enhanced uh, social safety net, uh, things that don't exist in America are largely like housing first models and these really great comprehensive programs. Uh, but the world is never gonna be the same because of COVID-19. Uh, last year, the federal government spent ballpark $50 billion enforcing drug laws. They're not gonna spend that this year and we're already seeing, I think, a quicker end to the war on drugs than we can imagine. Uh, we've seen leadership in multiple states uh, overturning prohibitive policies around the provision of harm reduction. Uh, you know, Janet Mills in Maine uh, lifted restrictions on syringe access. Um, that's a policy that, should, policy that should stay in place. Uh, New Hampshire has very low barriers to medication assisted recovery right now. People can access Suboxone through their phone. Uh, we need to keep those restrictions low on agonist therapies for opioid use disorders because they work. And uh, you know, we really need to set a precedent that uh, in the midst of this public health crisis, on top of multiple public health crises, we need to uh, emphasize the importance of keeping people out of the hospital and the fact that um, the comorbidity for people that use drugs or people that live in homelessness when it comes to COVID-19 is going to be more expensive. I'm um, looking at new data from the CDC that I shared with the group uh, the CDC released uh, new guidelines because hepatitis C has become so uh, prevalent in America that they're saying that everyone in a lifetime should be tested for hep C and any woman who's pregnant should, should be tested because this, and that's largely aggravated uh, by the addiction crisis and, or, and that is aggravated by prohibition. And um, what does that really mean for equity and, and justice though? Um, I define harm reduction a million different ways, but really what harm reduction does is insulate people from structural violence and those uh, systemic issues of injustice and inequity. Uh, harm reduction empowers people to have a voice and to respond to this and make more informed decisions and have uh, a place to be heard. Um, you know, living your life day in, day out criminalized is tiring and frustrating. And, and, and harm reduction gives people a pathway to recovery and a pathway of recovery. And harm reduction not only insulates people from structural violence, but it also shifts power and resources that are to people who are most vulnerable to structural violence. So when we look at the legalization of cannabis, we need to be giving 
uh, licensing to those who are impacted by the drug war. We need to ensure that this industry doesn't get handed over to rich white millionaires, which is what's happening with cannabis legalization as it rolls out. Um, here in New Hampshire, any bill that I've seen to legalize cannabis included the provision that felons couldn't have these licenses. That makes no sense. Uh, I, you know, burning someone a felon is a lot of ways um, a death sentence to the black market for access to money. Uh, this is a system that does not make a lot of sense. And so we really need to emphasize the importance of public health and, and harm reduction because with, with harm reduction, all drug-related death and disease is preventable. And so these goals of zero drug-related death is possible. Are, you know, these goals are possible, but it means comprehensive policy reform, uh, you know, decriminalization or a uh, short-term uh, step towards that could be the defelonization of simple possession. Uh, the state of Colorado passed a defelonization bill uh, that decriminalized simple possession of four grams or less of any any substance, uh, then we need to be really looking at policies that make sense, like Portugal, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, um, and now looking at state by state as I think 100 municipalities are trying to decriminalize uh, psychedelic drugs uh, of, of all kinds for, for research and for personal use. Um, so the end of the war on drugs is here, and we need to ensure that that empowers communities that are impacted by the drug war and create a system of equity and justice. I love the way that you said that, that it insulates people from structural violence, that I think that that is um, so incredibly true. And I, and, uh, and we have to fight, we need people who do understand uh, uh, you do understand this inside of our legislature. We need to have people who are willing to put their, because sometimes I think like you, some, there's different methods for getting policies passed. So you can do it, chip away at it small, slowly, um, incrementally. Uh, and I remember in uh, Kai, one of Kaya's Morris's speeches, she said that's like death by a thousand paper cuts. Uh, and um, but also, I sometimes think that if you put forth what needs to happen as your legislation, most likely it will be compromised a lot of it away. Um, but at least you've now started the conversation about what needs to happen. And so part of the reason for having this event and also in general talking about this regularly and publicly is so that we're saying what does need to happen to make change. Uh, because it is that conversation with the broader community that helps us to understand um, uh, the change that we make. And I just saw something come in that, that kind of relates to that. So, um, so uh, Jean was talking about whether or not what you said was realistic. And so what I want to say is that, it, that, that that is also another thing that, that we have to work on with policy is, um, is sometimes things seem not realistic because everything is impossible until it's done. You know, so I, there are all of the big changes that we've made in the world have have happened because we fought for them and we said out loud that they need to happen. And what we're seeing right now during COVID-19 is uh, the big, big, bright spotlight of these inequities and the big, bright spotlight of the systems that never worked in the first place. And we're sitting on a structure, an economic structure, a social structure that um, that was entirely designed um, in a way that, that relied on uh, the continued abuse and overworking of um, low income uh, people just below, just at, or just above the margin. And what we found is that actually, if anything happens that takes that apart, our entire system evaporates. And so, uh, so we might have to change our system. And that goes from everywhere from um, systemic, uh, our systemic structures to our economic structures to our, uh, the way we deal with uh, drug violence and drug um, use. And, uh, and I think that it, you know, system, systemic change, structural violence, systemic violence um, and inequities 
are people made and they can be people fixed. And so it is time for us to, to be the people that fix them. And that's really what I think is important. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I think that, that, that Dane has something to say now. Yeah, and I'll talk way before you do, sorry. Yeah, sure. People, please, if you're in, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on Progressive Insider, if you're watching on here, please do start typing in your questions. And if you're in here, we will bring you up. And so you can ask the question if you want, um, and we'll see your faces. Or you can just type it in and we'll answer it that way. So go ahead, Dave. Great. Uh, so I really love the point. I love this uh, capacity within our time of COVID-19 to look at our current state of things. And while it's so negative, be able to say something like, this is the beginning of the end of the war on drugs. Um, I think that is just, I think what needs to be the kind of uh, mentality that gets us gets us through this as we start to look forward to what the next steps are. And I also wanted to say uh, to Brenda and Kesha for the uh, petition that you put forward and the letter, thank you so much for doing that work. Um, I think it is incredibly important and uh, just want to really reiterate that. Um, I also want to bring to attention uh, along these COVID-19, everything changing, sentiments over since uh, mid-March, um, as some of you may know, the prison population has uh, in Vermont has dropped 15%. And meanwhile, passed by the Senate, it has been S-338, uh, which is the act relating to uh, criminal justice reinvestment. And basically it's a sweeping reform basically to look at expanding uh, parole, probation, furlough, and just programming as opposed to, uh, and that when you are in that programming, it will count towards uh, your minimum sentence. Um, so basically looking, they set the goal of reducing prison populations 10%. And here we are at 15% today. And the idea is just let's get this passed so that the people that have been released don't just get reincarcerated. And uh, I think I just wanted to put that out into people's feelers, uh, S338. Justice reinvestment bill is a really good, uh, is a really good bill. And it, a lot of research went into it. Um, there's some really uh, incredible, it's a work of a lot of work with Vermonters criminal justice reform. So I wanna right. name that, um, that I'll, I'll, a very, very, very hard work, lots of testimony, lots of research that was passed through. Um, and uh, I think actually um, Keisha's campaign manager works for them as well. I'm also, I also work with Tom Dalton all the time, um, who is the executive director. And, uh, and but uh, I know that Keisha's campaign manager was hugely involved in um, in testimony and uh, and the senators really just love him. So I'm gonna let her talk about that a little bit if she knows a little bit more from his point of view. I could talk from Tom's, but I do think that um, he's a person of color and I do think that his point of view is someone that we really wanna hear and your point of view is one that we really wanna hear here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you both for bringing that up. And um, so Skylar Nash is my campaign manager, um, young black man from Chicago, who's at the University of Vermont. Um, has a really interesting life story. I can try and dig up one of the recent links. Um, he had cancer as a teenager, survived it, was on the basketball team, but had some recurring health issues that meant he had to retire from the basketball team um, and reinvent himself and do equity work for UVM athletics, but also saw what was happening in the state and felt like he could make a difference there. So a great story. Um, and I, even I'm amazed how much of a difference it has made to have people of color um, who are able to self-advocate, uh, not able to, they always have been, but sort of have uh, the, the ear of people in power. Um, it has always made a huge difference. It made a huge difference with uh, all of the advances we've made for migrant farm workers to have people at the table and in the building who come from the migrant farm worker community and are involved with migrant justice. Um, so similarly, uh, Skyler first picked up a bill that I had worked on with Barbara Rachelson in the House many years ago, 
um, to end uh, to end life prison sentences for uh, minors. And um, he really wanted, so that was even hard to do. <laughs> and um, he had wanted to take it a step further to ending um, life sentences without parole for anyone. Um, you know, he's really learned how to navigate the system and the challenges that you may be talking about. Many, many people who got caught up in a system at a very young age, but you, you end up bumping up against, you know, very compelling, uh, emotionally compelling victims, vi uh, families of victims, which, you know, are Im important, they're compelling, they're people who deserve to be heard, and you're often weighing their testimony against the faceless, voiceless people uh, caught up in the, in the criminal injustice system who really don't have the opportunity often to testify or share their perspective. So I do think Skyler and Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform really see themselves as trying to bring those voices in, which are probably the most underrepresented voices, some of the most underrepresented voices in the legislature. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, I got to know Tom Dalton during my governor's race, um, and uh, quickly he became someone, because, I you know, my nephew had just died um, at that time. Um, and uh, in between events, I would often um, cry, like all the way from in two places. And I went the day that I released the plan to heal the o o opioid epidemic, which I now say the plan to heal the overdose crisis, because I do think we have to change the way we talk about it. Uh, but the day I released that plan, um, uh, the night before, I was literally um, on my knees crying um, and trying to figure out how I would have the strength to tell any part of his story or release this plan. Um, and Tom, who I didn't really know, I'd had one meeting with him, I reached out to him and he, and consistently, um, as I've been advocating, he has been, uh, he understands how important it is that people with the stories are telling the stories, that people who have had the experiences are at the decision-making table. And so he is willing to stand back and be a support while he watches um, while he, so that those people are able to do that. Uh, similarly, uh, on this bill, H783, which is a terrible bill that's in the legislature right now, um, some of you have seen me scream about it, um, that uh, really takes away the residential rights of the tenant rights of people who are in recovery, in recovery homes. Um, I worked very hard on that bill, and it was going to be a uh, really was a wonderful, beautiful bill in, in, in every way that you could uh, have it be. It wasn't perfect, but like as close as you could get with all that, with all the stakeholders sitting at the table and all of the protections for people in recovery got taken away. Uh, and um, what I realized is that what it was addressing was something that had happened to Kaya. Like I noted in the beginning, um, he had been removed from a recovery home for using buprenorphine and um, and he had one of the worst reoccurrences of his life. And I have no way of knowing if any of these times when the system failed him would have been the time he would have been alive and I would he would be able to be here telling you his own story. And, uh, and I found myself really not falling apart in the state house, which had never happened to me before. Um, after several, I'd been advocating and advocating, trying to get it to change and advocating with a lot of pressure um, on me to, accept this bill that I call fire alarm, fire, danger, 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 bad, get out of the house. There might be carbon. Um, that's how bad I think the bill is, and I've never said that about a bill before. Um, but I, um, I found myself having the same kind of emotional reaction I had the day I heard Kaya died. Um, and uh, realizing that I, that, it, that I needed to step back and advocate in a different way. Um, because because I because we do have to be at the table, but also legislators and people in those meetings and in leadership roles need to listen to those stories. They need to change because we are telling them. Um, because it, I don't think people realize just thanking us for our story, just thanking Ryan for a story or Dane for your story, is not enough. Um, because. It, it is extremely hard to walk into your pain every single day and tell your stories and fight for change. So when you see that people are doing that, you must 
understand that they know something you don't and uh, that we have to lift up and hear. And also the amount of energy and work that I see that Dave's doing, that Ryan has done, that I have done to actually understand the science and be able to come at this with um, very good information, not just our personal stories, but very inf good information to back those up, um, means that then it is important to then react to those changes. Um, so I want to be really clear that uh, that that part of what I would say about this entire issue is that, and, and this is the same uh, with racial justice issues and with ethnic justice issues and, um, and climate justice issues, really all the justices that when historically marginalized people are running for office, when they're coming to the table, when they're uh, people who, with economic justice as well, when they're coming and telling you their story and the solution, what they actually need to make a change, then it is imperative that we listen, that we step back and we hear, and that we allow those stories to come forward, and that those stories and the science that backs them up are the things that drive the decisions we make, the policy decisions we make. I think that's really essential, and I think for some reason I find myself right now, Keisha, thinking about um, the, uh, thinking about, uh, the presidential race, I don't know why, but thinking about um, your experience and um, I think sometimes people's reaction to it was maybe um, not as respectful that, uh, that I think understanding why it's important to have that kind of representation um, in office is, um, is extremely, you know, whatever it is, for, you know, it's important to me to have a low-income single mom in office and I'm willing to step in and try to be that person uh, and, and you know, I plan to this time. And then, uh, and then, you know, it's important. I, I think, I just think that that's, that he, understanding that that's part of how change gets made is really important. So I'll uh, let any of you that want to say something come up. Um, and, uh, and if there's anyone monitoring anything that has questions they want to ask, um, we've gotten a lot of thank yous, not a lot of questions. Uh, so please feel free to ask us any questions about any of these issues. Um, for the last few minutes that we're on. Does anyone want to giant chime in here? I just, I do want to thank Gretchen. I, I wrote her a thank you, um, but I appreciate, you know, her being able to share a little bit about her story and for people who are even going through this right now and not like you ever get over it, but you know, who are uh, working through challenges in their families and with addiction right now, who are able to have this conversation and be part of it. I. I keep reflecting on how um, we really want this moment to change us, and yet it's a really hard time for us to have new conversations. So we're sitting in houses and talking to friends and family and the same people we're very comfortable with or our own social network, which is very curated, whether or not we know it. And you know, to be able to talk to people across difference and have these conversations becomes even more important if we somehow wanna have a paradigm shift or a different world when we come out of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's really cliche at this point, but I don't know why it's so hard to sort of really absorb and live into the knowledge that women are crushing it at like their public health response when they're leading countries. And that is what happens when, when women lead. You know, I, I forget who said like, it would just be really nice to have a mom in the White House right now. Can't think of, you know, I, I just want to acknowledge that sort of a, email identifying statement to make but um you know there's a lot of uh caring maternal energy we could really use in our politics at this moment um and yet in times of crisis we still snap back to that kind of strong tall man and i get it but you know um if we look at the data like we've been saying this whole time you know when women lead families do better uh, young people do better everyone does better. And in fact, even when women are doctors, you know, empirically, patients do better. So, you know, I think um, representation really, really matters. And I hope that uh, is a lesson we take away from this crisis. Yeah, no. yeah and I want to say that I, 
you know, for me in, in Senator Sanders, there was obviously, um, I'm, he's Jewish, and I, I don't think I ever even thought that it was possible that a Jewish person could be president. In fact, I've often thought a woman could be president, but didn't think a Jewish good person could be. And that must be somewhere in the messaging that, um, that we didn't talk about it. Uh, so it mattered to me too. I mean, it was something that did also, that I recognized and acknowledged that um, it's part of my history and culture, that um, my family left Nazi Germany. And so, um, there's and then, you know, and then in in Senator Warren, there was the, um, you know, I got into law school and I didn't go because I did not have childcare and it was going to be two hundred thousand dollars in loans and I did not have a family member that was going to jump in and take care of my child while I went and um, and so I took more dance work because it was what I could do and so her that story for her really was something that was important for me to hear it was important to me that she was on that stage and um and so the reason i guess i'm bringing this up because in this issue it's it, they're more tangible things for us to grab onto right it is this this place where um where where we are um really looking at uh what where, why it matters that we're at the table right so we are part of this ryan and i are part of this overdose crisis cohort this national overdose crisis cohort where uh the people at the table are mostly either in recovery or family members um some are people who work in the field um, and aren't but uh for the most part that's who, who we're talking about and talking to um and as we're hearing about the solutions that are going on and the changes that are going on and the successes that we're having in different parts of the country that's all stuff that that's like some of the best science that we're you know some of the best information um that can dictate our changes in our own states um it is that is that information um you know before we go uh we have a few more minutes and i do want ryan just tell us a little bit about what you do because i do think that that's important because it is the harm reduction aspect yeah so i thought that that was great talking about people with lived experience being at the table. Uh, that was a big part of the story in Portugal as well. There was a former injection drug user who really spearheaded that movement. And there was uh, people uh, most impacted by their policy at the table. And uh, harm reduction kind of waves a banner of nothing about us without us. You know, we need drug policy that's informed not only by science, but by people with lived experience. Um, and there was a Q&A question that came in that will kind of roll into what I do over here in New Hampshire. Um, over here in New Hampshire, I um, last year I primarily focused on overdose prevention efforts in Manchester and Nashua, New Hampshire, uh, trying to saturate um, two cities that are maybe the most impacted by the overdose crisis. Uh, creating a public health response, uh, retraining a lot of people about the role of um, rescue breathing and oxygen during an overdose situation. And you can respond with rescue breathing and CPR as well as naloxone. Uh, and that was for 2019. And then uh, this year I've been um, you know, running and expanding harm reduction programming in uh, rural New Hampshire. Um, now with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the work has changed quite a bit with social distancing and so the past few weeks it's largely just been uh, mobile student services uh, going out to meet people where they're at uh, people can call for a meetup and um, it's been really quiet for the majority of the COVID crisis I'm getting on a one-on-one -on -one call tomorrow with somebody at the state level to see why it is that there's a lot of harm reduction programs in New Hampshire that are just very recently being funded. Uh, Vermont's had legal syringe access since 2006. New Hampshire passed uh, the preserves laws in 2017. We're just now getting funding, and right now the programs are being underutilized, but the reality is that people are now able to pick up their smartphone and through a one-hour telehealth call get a prescription to Suboxone at the pharmacy through a provider called Better Life Partners. Uh, so these lower restrictions on agonist therapies for opioid use disorder are potentially, and the numbers aren't in because of the COVID, are potentially creating a serious reduction in fatal overdose in New Hampshire. The data is not in, but that is really the only way I could describe this. Um, and so what can you as individuals do to support uh, the work that we're all trying to do in ending the overdose crisis? Um, access to the locks 
the people who are most likely to use naloxone to reverse an overdose are people who use drugs. Um, and this one is the whole bystander piece too. So uh, prior to this, I had sent out a couple of links to share with uh, attendees. Um, and that involves a program called Next Distro, and that's needle exchange technology uh, org. It's run by a woman named Jamie. Uh, one of the documents is kind of her info, and that's uh, mail order access to harm reduction supplies. Uh, because for much of rural New Hampshire and rural Vermont, there's no syringe access right now. And during the a public health crisis, with the issues of comorbidity and preventable infections and disease and death. Uh, we need to be responding to this in a, in a meaningful way and uh, looking at the most vulnerable and at risk for COVID. We're not going to control the spread of it, yes, until a vaccine, but we're not going to uh, mitigate the spread until we focus on uh, largely people who use drugs, the, the homeless population. And so we need to ensure that those people have access to sanitation and hygiene and harm reduction. And so nextdistro.org uh, also has a program called uh, naloxone for all or uh, naloxone for all .org. and for uh, more and more states you can go to naloxone for all .org backslash new hampshire and there's a pretty comprehensive list of resources uh they need a vermont affiliate and uh, one of the links that i had queued up prior to this to go up the uh, attendees included uh, starting a program for states without an affiliate to be receiving supplies legally through the mail, uh, syringes, works, naloxone, and things like that, to get it to people who, who really need it. Um, there's the website naloxoneforall.org slash backslash availability. Um, we really just need to support people and keep them alive because dead people don't enter recovery. Really, people on a natural pathway towards recovery and we need to be focusing on keeping people alive so that you know they receive the gifts that i did like recovery is sweet it really is but it wasn't until the world around me made sense and my needs were met that i was able to move past that that behavior um so so yeah i mean i've been in harm reduction for a couple of years direct services um the more I do the work, the more I see why people use drugs. Um, a lot of poverty, racism, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of trauma. Um, and those are cycles that are um, contagious, if you will. Like, you know, traumatized people, traumatized people. But those cycles can be broken through recovery. And I've seen it time and time again. Recovery is possible and it does work. but. Everyone is just so unique and different, and you know, harm reduction is about honoring people's agency and autonomy and empowering them to improve their, their health and wellness. Um, so I really appreciate you all kind of taking the time to, to listen to myself and these wonderful people sharing experience, and hopefully we can um, thrive in this time of adversity. You know, we're in a public health crisis that involves an infectious disease that could impact everybody. People are open to public health and public health responses. And with the looks of the economy, especially today, and the budget, uh, they're not going to be able to be enforcing drug laws. We're already seeing that drug laws aren't being enforced. So we need to ride this public health wave to an age where you know people are not dying of overdose. So uh, thank you all for listening. So uh, uh, thanks so much, Ryan. That's that's the kind of work that does need to be done, and it needs to be done by people who are in recovery, because then there is a much more uh, aptitude to understand, I think, the overall problem. Um, and then I want to just address, um, Gretchen wrote a comment and also asked a question. So the first, um, the comment was about her um, family member not being able to uh, not being able to access treatment, the help they need in Vermont. That is not a unique story. That was our family story. Um, that is story after story after story that I hear. This is not, it's always anecdotal because we don't have access to the data. The data is not transparent actually. Um, the exact data that's in the health department, we don't, we can't see it. Um, the excuse of, uh, of HIPAA is used, but it wouldn't have to be HIPAA if it was put into data form. Um, and uh, and so, and it would help us a lot to understand where the holes and gaps are. Uh, so um, I just wanna encourage you, Gretchen, 
absent of how I'm gonna answer the next, your next question, to please advocate in Vermont for the experience you had, because I think um, it, it, we, we keep getting shut down about, um, about what we know is true because we've had the experience. And uh, we need to keep saying it, even though um, I, I imagine this dance that I, I run the Southern Rock Dance Festival. There was this dance a couple of years ago uh, where it was based, it was about slavery, um, but the per people um, got knocked down and they stood up and they held hands and marched forward. They got knocked down and stood up and held hands and marched forward. And all of these issues, we need to get down, stand up, hold hands and walk forward when we're allowed to hold hands again. But figuratively hold hands. Uh, and um, and then on your other issue, on your other question, which was, you know, how can, which I'm grateful for, um, uh, how can, who've been, how can you support, get involved in supporting each of us now? Um, so I want to say that as a candidate, I, I would like personally to see all these people elected because I think that there will be a true fight uh, for, um, or not fight, but a true push for a, um, a comp comprehensive change uh, that, will, that will help people and support people. Um, for our campaign, I'll let other people talk for themselves, but for our campaign, we need people to make calls. It's very, very hard um, to, for people to volunteer right now because they're, they're really tired um, and everybody's dealing with their own stuff. So even if it's 15 minutes a day of texting or writing postcards or making calls to help, uh, you know, I'm a, we're a statewide race. So to help us get to the, the many, many people we need to, um, that would be great. And, uh, and uh, another thing is sharing your story with us. Uh, we would love to hear, we would love that to, um, the, even if you want to share it in video form or we want to have a conversation on Facebook Live, I would love to do that with you and hear more um, or just privately. Uh, so, uh, or an anonymous quote, whatever, we would love to share your story in terms of opioid issues. And then lastly, for the people that are on the call, please do donate because again, well, if you're comfortable and if you're able right now to do that, um, because it is a really hard climate for fundraising for candidates and we do have to pay our staff. And we do have to, um, we don't want them to lose their jobs either. And we don't, and we want to make sure that we are um, able to do whatever we're doing in terms of support for COVID, in terms of um, working on issues, and we do need contributions to that. So that link has gone up a few times, we'll put it up again. Um, and whatever you donate will be split evenly between Dane, Keisha, and I. So I'll let Dane and Keisha both say what they need as well. And then we'll have a quick closing statement after that. We're going a little bit over, just being respectful of people's time. Um, so we're just going to do this, and then we'll also have a closing statement. Go ahead, Dane. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, everybody, again, so much for uh, spending the time, all the panelists for sharing their stories, uh, Judy for translating. Um, I, uh, I want to say as far as ways that people can help, uh, I would really just suggest to continue sharing your story and continuing to humanize things. And I, I just want to be clear, something has gone funny where I've lost video of everybody. And so I'm kind of, uh, I'm like experiencing an, an empathy gap myself right now. Um, but I do want to say that um, just continue sharing this story, uh, your stories, just having the conversation. Um, we had a screening of the film Hungry Heart in Bennington um, to basically an empty theater. Uh, very few people uh, came out to see it. And meanwhile, we could admit that we had this huge problem and yet the question of stigma continues on a, such a big level. We have um, our syringe service, ex our syringe exchange in Bennington, uh, anecdotally, I don't know from any data, but we have an exchange that's hardly accessed at all. So thinking about what to do with the services that we already have and optimize them is, is something I'm really interested to and I'm interested at the social, at the social side of things. So. As far as supporting the campaign, um, I would just say, 
any any send me a send me a positive note you know i think if you if you chip five dollars towards this that little bit of morale boost will get me through the next little bit and uh that will be very very appreciated um otherwise continue staying engaged continue staying active um support the people in your community so thank you Yeah, thanks. I, I, you two both covered it incredibly well. And the only other thing I would add is that what we've seen, particularly pronounced from 2016 onward, is that people look to their friend circle and the people who watch Zoom, you know, panels like these to figure out who they trust and who they would rely on to, to um, help them decide who to vote for. And so, you know, sharing on social media, um, on Front Porch Forum, in a letter to the editor even instead of just a positive note to the candidate a positive note to the world um you know those kinds of things are going to make a huge difference um i've just been thinking about lawn signs actually seem like they matter this year because people are just not able to have all of those one-on-one -on -one or coffee conversations that they used to ask who are you supporting for state senate they're going to see the lawn sign on somebody's lawn when they're getting out for like a you know quarantine walk or whatever so you know, it's a different world where people's worlds are smaller and you become a bigger part of that and having your support and you sharing that is going to make a difference for all of us. Yes, definitely. Letters to the editor. I don't know why I didn't think of that. And share, please share, comment, like, and tweet, retweet, reshare, Instagram, whatever. Um, please do all those things because that is uh, that does help our algorithms. And I can, in this particular, that always matters a little, but in this particular race, um, it matters a lot. So uh, because it is what where people are is in in this. Uh, so uh, so I, and they're on the screen. Um, so that is hugely important. Um, and when you're researching candidates besides us, please deeply look at um, what they've supported, what they do, what they will support, um, and not just. Uh, their surface platform, because I do think that the surface platform is often very progressive for all of us. And we say, um, we might say the right words, but we don't necessarily, if you dig deep, we don't necessarily have the, um, the plans or the platform uh, or the, the, the political will to uh, shift the, the conversation. Um, and so, uh, I mean, everyone here does. But, but as candidates in general, uh, and so I, I want to be really clear that um, when you're looking, please, please um, look hard. So I'm going to give everyone and, and and volunteer donate all the things. Plus, the morale boost of even five dollars is a real morale boost right now. And so if people are able to donate even five dollars or three dollars only to get one is totally a <laughs> it totally is like oh people liked us so <laughs> it's good uh so i wanted to um uh everyone to give a little closing statement and i'm going to start with uh ryan again i just want to express my gratitude for you all coming together to learn about this issue that's been obviously my life experience and now my life's work um there's, there's a lot that can be said. This is a really complicated issue. And um, when we start to move away from a system of criminalization and prohibition, what we'll hopefully see is that um, you know substances like methadone and buprenorphine will kind of become irrelevant. Uh, people will be able to explore uh, plants and alternatives. And um, you know, I think that we forget that most of human history involved growing poppies and making tea or growing poppies and doing a really light extraction. Um, I see that as a pathway out of the fentanyl crisis, uh, using innovations in pharmaceuticals to have better opioids that last longer and make more sense that are more effective. Uh, many countries have moved towards heroin assisted treatment using uh, diacetyl morphine to uh, treat opioid use disorder, um, you know, Canada, many parts of Europe, and now trials in Scotland are showing a lot of prog um, really uh, big promise. And something that I wanted to highlight um, 
yesterday was Bicycle Day, uh, celebrating the 77th anniversary of the first human LSD experience. I uh, learned a lot yesterday about the application of psychedelics as treatment for addictive disorders. And it turns out that at one point in Vermont, state legislature did have a bill that explored the use of Ibogaine to treat opioid addiction. And there's a really great documentary, I'm going to plug the uh, link in here, um, about alternative pathways to recovery for people that um, experience disconnection and isolation and separation. And as we as a species head into this, you know, COVID crisis and everything else, these are issues of disconnection and um, lack of sense of self. We're disconnected from nature and the earth and from each other. And for many psychedelics are a way out of that trap. And so we need to be exploring these in clinical settings, which is happening all throughout the world. Um, and so that's my, my pump for psychedelic science as a potential pathway to and of recovery. Thank you, Ryan. And <clears throat> quickly, both my nephew and my sister-in-law did are <clears throat> using Ibogaine. We went to Mexico to do it. Um, and uh, and uh, I think my sister-in-law would say it was successful to a point. She did have a reoccurrence, but it did help her um, in terms of uh, addressing it. So um, uh, I, I think there is a place for all of it because it's not, like we've been saying, every solution isn't gonna reach everyone. Um, so we have to have a lot of different ones. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Dane. Cool. Uh, thank you, Brenda. And thank you again, everybody. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, I just want to say again, uh, I am coming at this from a place of growth, and I hope that everybody can come at everything to, with a place of growth as much as as much as they can. Um, in these days. Everybody just keep maintaining faith that we're going to be able to move on this, keep doing good work, uh, stay informed uh, if you have the time and have hard conversations and compassionate hard conversations with people of differing opinions if you have the, if you have the wherewithal. Um, and run for public office if you, if you are so inclined. Um, take care, stay safe, and be well, everybody. Thank you. And I want to just throw out there that Dane and I have had lots of those tough conversations over the last little while, and um, and we will continue to. Uh, and I think that is extremely important to this shift. Uh, so I'm going to kick it over to Keisha. Thanks. And Ryan, I hope you run for office. I don't know if it would be in Vermont or New Hampshire, but both states could use you. So yes, everyone on this call, please consider running for office. It makes a huge difference and changes the conversation. Um, the thing, I often try to find something to reflect on and hold on to in a crisis, because otherwise we go from crisis to crisis, it seems like, in this country and don't always come out of it any better off or any more whole. And um, my partner told me, because I was saying something like, oh, you must, when they're thinking about how to treat COVID-19 and attack it, they have to get the right weapons and the generals, you know, I had this very... Um, a systemic violence or sort of like this idea in my mind that you're attacking it like you're in a war and he said actually I was listening to the radio and you know there's this really interesting um, mindset that doctors use that it's much more about how does your body learn to fight something how does it sort of how does it go from throwing what it knows at something to learning what it is and changing and diversifying how it uh, you know fights this this illness and this virus, and I just think that's so relevant for the moment that we're in and the future. Is you know it's not always about a war or hostility or sort of getting all your soldiers in order to, and creating a new enemy. Um, you know it's about growth mindset and adapting and having a diverse set of tools in your toolbox to all these challenges. So um, I'm sort of holding on to that as so you come out of, hopefully come out of this crisis and think about the future challenges ahead of us. Thank you, Keisha. And, uh, and I agree, Ryan, you should run for office. Uh, and uh, I want to say uh, also that running for office and losing is still, you still make change. And so if you're not, uh, if you're not running for that reason, still run. I also want to say in the beginning of this race, 
um, somebody started, a, I, don't, I don't know who, so I can only say somebody, started a rumor in one area of the state that I cried in a, uh, in testimony. I cried in the state house in testimony. And so I do not have the, um, I did not have the right, uh, let's or whatever, for, um, for, be, for being in this office, for being lieutenant governor. And uh, I thought long and hard about if I would say out loud that that had happened. Um, and I believe it had to, we were, I was only in a room with official people, so it had to have been an official person who did that too. Um, and uh, it, what I realized is that uh, I don't have a problem talking about it because I did cry. I cried because I was telling the story of uh, my nephew, who I helped raise, who was, I was a huge part of his upbringing, dying, um, and me being the person that, that got that call. And I want my elected leaders to cry. I want my elected leaders to show emotion. So what I'm asking all of you to do who are watching, to tell your stories, to show your emotions, to cry, to be angry, to get excited, to be silly. You guys have probably seen me do that on my page this, this race. Um, to be silly, whatever it is, do cry and run for office because we need more of that. I'm not ashamed um, of crying and I and I don't know anyone would think I would be. I cried every time I was on the stage during my governor's race and I still am doing it again. So uh, so I think that it, please do it. Um, in terms of opioids, I want you to fight with me. It's often very few of us telling these stories uh, I want to hear your story. My story is getting uh, getting tired, uh, so so I want to hear yours, and I want yours to be the the front uh, of of this issue as well. I want to make sure that you're it's you that's in front of that you that's having testimony. It's you that's writing a commentary, and I will help you write a commentary and put it in. I want to make sure that it's you that's doing the letter writing and speaking out. Uh, so. Please do that with me, and um, and I mean now. If you want, if you want to reach out to me and say, how do I help? How do I write my own story and make sure that it's published? I will help you make sure that it's published. Um, so uh, that's that's I think the message I want to leave you with. This fight is not over, but it is like Ryan said, we have a moment right now for all of this systemic oppression. Um, to, like I said, people made and we, people can fix it. So I hope that you will fight with all of us. Um, I hope that you will run for office and I hope that you will tell your story. Um, we're gonna leave the chat up for a second so that I, a lot of people are asking for the donation link and they're also asking if they can, um, if they're gonna get the, all the links from the chat. So if you signed in, you will get all the links from the chat um, and we're also gonna send it to anyone who signed up. Uh, so, so if you happen to be watching on Facebook, Facebook Live, you'll, you'll get it that, that way too. I really want to thank everyone for being here. I apologize for going over. Um, and uh, Ryan for, and Dane for sharing your stories, and Kate for your expertise. Uh, and I hope that we're having this conversation again in a year from now uh, while we're all actively fighting this in office. Thank you.